I was reading my diary from 44 years ago, and an important rule I've just got to mention. Greetings, David McMillan here. 45 years in the smuggling trade, man and boy. Imprisoned on five continents and headed for death row twice. Escaped a few times. You can hear all of that on Sean Atwood's YouTube channel, but here I get to open up on the many things Sean and I glided over without time for details. So today, a little story from my early years, and then a very important rule to follow. A rule that few underground traders or anyone else seem to follow. I was reading one of the freebie newspapers on a train this morning, so Benny and the magician moved on to Anne, an 82-year-old retired teacher with bright eyes. She responded to a little sex and a little magic with biblically toned messages appearing on the mirrors in her home. If she too changed her written will, she'd be doing the will of the Lord, the will of the Lord. I've heard that before. Those messages appearing on the bathroom hallway mirror in that case, it took me back 44 years to my time in Lebanon, the Near East. I'd left home in search of adventure and riches. I traveled through India first, trying to buy hashish, but having no contacts, I began on the street, asking the New Delhi shoeshine boys who scored low-grade puff for me. Well, that went nowhere. I soon fell prey to swindlers, who cleaned me out when I tried to score big. The shoeshine boys I could trust, their older cousins I could not. Almost penniless, I traveled overland and by cheap Soviet flights to Beirut, Lebanon, Arab-speaking French colonial. Beirut, the Paris of the East in the mid-70s. I would make my fortune in Lebanon, I thought at 19. Arriving at the outset in 1975, I visited the Beka Valley to link up with the name I'd been given. The winds were favorable, as they say, and I hoped to be part of a large shipment of fine-grained Lebanese gold hashish, to be packed in dinnerware and transshipped through Dubai to Sydney. Yet no amount of fair wind can make up for a lack of cash, so I took on local work. In Britain around the same time, we had such a thing as sitting tenants. That is, people who'd rented your house at a fixed price. The law at the time said that they could stay at the same rent almost forever. It wasn't easy to get them out. I was told that sitting tenants were a problem in Beirut too. I was surprised. The Middle East? Getting a tenant to move out? Surely just a matter of threats and implied violence. Not so easy. Start bully boy tactics in that part of the world and you'll have family blood feuds that escalate into a full-on war. A bad choice. By then, I'd met a few people in Beirut who were in the film business, technicians and camera operators. I'd worked as a camera operator in Sydney the previous year, and Sydney has a large expat Lebanese population. Here in Beirut, we had the idea we could scare the tenants out of the rented houses. The city has a mix of Christian and Muslim people, not fundamentalists, but deep feeling. Now, one of the apartments we went to work on had a similar four-story block next door with a direct view of the dining room where the people lived. Another cameraman and I set up our base opposite, watching for a few days. A middle-aged couple lived there, in good health. They'd been there for many years, having taken over the flat from mum and dad. The owner had tried to pay them to leave, but with the rent still set at the 1950s level, they knew better than to leave that place, even with a 10,000 lira payoff. The owner had offered the equivalent of $5,000 for them to leave, but they wouldn't take it. Basil and I, Basil worked at a Beirut film company, had noticed that the wife would cross herself as she left the house each morning. The dining room, where they ate most nights, had crosses on the walls, and Jesus 
Jesus and Mary statuettes on the cabinets. The man of the house didn't show any religious feelings. He simply arrived home from work each day, tired. They ate together most nights in the dining room, sometimes with a neighbour. The drapes were never drawn. Our breakthrough idea came when we managed a loan of an argon CO2 gas laser from the university. Some changes were made as we'd be operating from, say, 200 feet. But after testing, Basil and I were ready to go. A week after taking the job, the tenants, who wouldn't leave, sat down together one evening with a neighbour. As they finished their meal and began on coffee, a hissing smoke spilled from the wall at their side. A point on the wall began to spark and move. As it moved, the point became a line, and the line took shape. A fiery drawing began to appear. Astonished, the husband pushed back from his chair. He stood and backed away. The wife held her napkin to her mouth. The neighbor froze. The burning line formed curls and points. An image was being formed, as though from a burning pen. The husband stood and walked toward the wall. The burning stopped. In fact, he'd walked in the path of the laser beam, so Basil had to stop for a moment. The man peered at the burned wall, sniffed at it, spoke rapidly. The neighbor left his chair and disappeared into the hallway. He was checking the bedroom behind the burning wall. The wife took a drink of strong arak. The neighbor returned to the dining room and shook his head. Nothing in there, he seemed to say. The husband, shaken, resumed his seat. Within seconds, the burning point began again, yet with a new fury. Flakes of paint caught fire and dropped to the polished floor. The lines moved fast as a searing torch. There was a little smoke in the room, but the CO2 laser left almost no strike line in the air, the laser's frequency producing invisible infrared. Besides, at the same time, the ground seemed to shake. Cups and glasses on the table rattled. The wife yelped. The men stuttered. A recognizable shape began to form on the wall in glowing embers and charcoal black. The outline of a devil's head, the leering goatish face, coarse fibers of hair, and lastly, horns whose tips torched into brief flames on the wall. The deep rumbling ceased as the smoke drifted around the dining room. No one spoke. Well, the problem tenants left all right the next day, and so did the neighbor. Basil had drawn the shape on the wall by attaching a set of guide rods to the tripod handles of the laser rig. The guide rods followed a stencil that I'd cut, revealing the most hideous devil face artwork that I could find. Oh, and the ground-shaking rumble came from a Sirwin Vega subsonic speaker we'd installed in the fire hose reel cupboard in the hallway. It created a sense around effect. So low it can't be heard, only felt. It was first used in the film Earthquake, which had shown a year earlier. We got paid for the job, but it ended there. The haunting of the apartment was so effective, not only did the problem tenants leave, but all the tenants. The building became unrentable. Sometimes you can scare people too much. I learned the power of controlling people through their beliefs, something I'd seen a couple of years earlier when working at showings of The Exorcist, where at every screening, someone would run screaming from the theater. As for Beirut, the entire city became full of devils, not of my making, not of any theatrical effect, but from a dozen armed factions. And the little film crew friends I had were, a year later, playing pop songs over the dead bodies of their enemies. It was the real world. For the next 15 years, the city and the country were torn apart by people who believed too much. That building and the entire neighborhood were reduced to rubble. But that's another story. I'm still recording long-form interviews over at Sean Atwood's YouTube channel, so keep track of those. There's four in the can, two on the air, and more to come. 
Sean is the man to go to for the big story. It was time for me to move on. But before I move on today, something important. Years ago, I thought I should publish a Crook's Book of Rules, even wrote out the Crook's Ten Commandments. I never published it. I'm a lazy slob, after all, who wouldn't have become a smuggler in the first place. Not if I had to work. That aside, commandment number four from the Crook's Book of Rules, the Dead Wood Rule. And no, the Dead Wood Rule doesn't mean passing on that extra line of coke if you forgot to bring some Viagra. In fact, the rule is an important practice when recruiting helpers, colleagues and confederates in your next underground mission. Does anyone remember the old TV series of Mission Impossible? In it, Master Operator Jim Phelps, uh, the character is called Ethan Hunt these days when played on screen by Tom Cruise, he's the lead. Anyway, when planning the next impossible mission, Jim would be seen going through his files, selecting just the right people for the task at hand. The right technicians, the perfect actors, the best drivers, safe crackers, explosive experts, whatever the job demanded. But he would not bring anyone to the crew who was not needed. No one would be given a job unless they had the skills and the scam would not be done by others in the team. In other words, no dead wood on the crew. This might sound perfectly straightforward, yet in practice it almost never is. How often have you been brought onto a team to find there are unnecessary people on board? This could be a heist, this could be a smuggling operation, or even a new legit venture. You look around to see three skilled and experienced people surrounded by half a dozen nitwits. So you ask why, and this is what you're told. Well, that's Bob, Ernie's best friend. He's always in on everything. Or Frank, he's always been good luck. Every time a job goes down without Frank, it goes tits up. Everyone's busted. Or Arnold, Arnold is Bob's cousin. He's out of work so we're trying to get him sorted. Or again, Mickey's here because he knows some heavyweight dudes. If anything goes wrong, Mickey will know who to get. And you'll usually hear, Terry, <laughs> that's John's girlfriend. She sticks to him like glue. John gets it in the neck at home if he leaves Terry out. Those are the excuses that are given. Now, bear in mind that for every extra person, there's yet another chance that person will talk to somebody carelessly or drop stupid hints to family that he'll be coming into some money sometime soon. So we can add another, what, five ears for every stick of dead wood we leave unproductively stuck to that tree. And of course, all those people want to cut of the pie if everything works out but it is not likely to work out. Why? Look at the dead wood carefully. Bob, Ernie's best friend, has been a useless twit all his life and would be broke if not leeching off his friends. Lucky Frank, without whom every job seems to go bad. Really? Well, if Frank's not invited on the job, he usually knows anyway. In fits of resentment, he runs all over town until everyone, including the police, know of the job. That's why jobs without Frank go bad. Or maybe he doesn't run around town. He just picks up the phone. Then there's cousin Arnold, who can't hold a job. And why is that? Arnold is an idiot. And Mickey, the guy who knows all those hard men if needed. Mickey is really no more than a parasite and a and an extortionist. The gang are secretly fearful that if Mickey is left out, those hard men will turn up for their cut anyway. It's fear that keeps Nicky in, not need. Odds are there are no hard men behind Mickey. And you'd have to ask yourself why those heavyweight dudes never call him on any job. 
they're ghosts. Just Mickey talk. I have to admit, in my young days, I didn't obey the Deadwood rule every time. Felt sorry for someone who needed work. And paid for it dearly each time. So cut away the Deadwood from your life. They might be fun to have around, but not when your life is on the line. If it's fun you want, there's a whole world to choose from. Next time, the whole world.